Well, 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 welcome back, everybody. My name is Greg Massey, and this is episode four of The Color of Air, a podcast about the musical journey. We have got a very special episode for you today because the day this episode drops, July 17th, is my birthday. And I'm not going to sing happy birthday to myself because I would probably sing it badly. But I do have a present to myself a little bit later on. But first, you can find us on the web www.colorofair.com or you can find us in the iTunes store where you can subscribe, rate, and review us. Or, if you don't like using Apple, you can find us on Stitcher where I believe you can also subscribe, rate, and review us. You can f- like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, at The Color of Air. And as always, if you have any comments or questions or want to interact, please drop us a line at colorofairpodcast at gmail.com. But let's talk about the guest today. My guest today is not a musician. However, he is just as important to the music process as as anybody else really who's involved his name is Ellie Rand Cantor and he is an artist he does CD covers he helps to design t-shirts or backdrops whatever your band needs done visually he can do it and I first met him in 2008 I believe when he was referred to me by Toby from Kodot because he at that time you know he had had a few um, CD releases but he was really out there contact contacting a lot of different musicians about the possibility of working with them and I admired him really kind of putting himself out there and really you know taking the time to contact me to you know listen to the music see what I wanted to do artistically and visually and he and he delivered. To see some examples of his work, you can go to his website, www.ellirancantor.com, or follow him on Facebook. I mean, he's done, I, I guess his most high profile work is Testament. He's worked with them since the formation of Damnation album, and he's designed uh, the, the album covers for that, plus the most recent album, Dark Roots of the Earth. He's designed t-shirts and backdrops. Um, He helped Eric Peterson of Testament with a custom guitar design, from what I'm seeing. Um, But he's also worked with lots of other people. Um, He worked with Iced Earth on their most recent album. He's worked with Psy. He's worked with Agora. And a bunch of other bands who I can't remember right now. The point being is he's really come up in the world in the last seven or so years that I've known him. And... And he's amazing. But, you know, I I never really had had a chance to talk to him very in depth. So this was a good chance to, you know, talk uh, over, you know, to actually hear his voice. But also just to see where he's come from. You know, he's got an interesting story, like anybody else who's involved in the arts. And, uh, you know, he originally is from um, Israel. And then he moved to... Berlin Germany for a little while now he's back in Israel for a little bit and you know I just wanted to see what got him started with wanting to do what he does and so it's a really interesting conversation which I hope you all enjoy but you know he isn't a musician so obviously I can't play you any of his music which I normally do on this podcast and frankly I don't want to risk the lawsuit of playing a testament song or an Iced Earth song, or some other song I need a license to get. So instead, and this counts as a birthday present to myself, throughout the interview, I'm going to intersperse the three songs that make up the Exordium EP released by my band Balaset last year. So those of you who have never heard 
the chance to hear my music are going to get that chance now. So, for those of you who don't know it, Exordium is a introduction of sorts, a prelude to a larger concept album that we're working on and still fine-tuning, I can tell you right now, as I have a you know, date with myself this weekend to sit at my computer and try to hammer out a new outline of the story to help with the writing of lyrics and all that other fun stuff. So it's a work in progress, but it should be out next year. And, you know, this was a, a big release for us because, you know, it was our first new music since 2009. So it was really important to get it out there. Um, we're doing something special with the release where if you go to our Bandcamp site, retconrecordings.com, and you buy the EP, which is $4, $2 from that are going to go to charity. The charity is something that my mother started. It's called Mains and Motions. It's a therapeutic writing center. And what therapeutic writing does is it helps children with autism or other disabilities, physical or mental, as well as soldiers coming back from Iraq or even from Vietnam who have been suffering with PTSD. And it's a charity that's been, you know, obviously very prevalent in my family, very important to my family since my mom started it. And there was a big campaign last year to get an indoor writing cam, sorry, an indoor writing arena for the program so that it could run year round and become self sustainable. So, anyway, you can, like I said, you can visit our van camp site, retconrecordings.com, and pick up a copy. But uh, if you want to hear the music first before you decide, you're going to get your chance throughout this interview. So up first is the track Moon and River.
Hi, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Great. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Okay, excellent. Nice hearing your voice after seven years of talking via emails only. Yes, <laughs> I know, right? I know. I feel like we've yeah we've been working together for so long, and yeah, no, it's nice to finally talk to you. <laughs> it's it's always uh, really awkward and bizarre when I meet someone in person after I've been working with him for so long. It's always like, hi, I'm Eliran, because <laughs> we're we're just like walking email addresses prior to this point. Yeah, <laughs> so it's always bizarre. <laughs> well. No, but that's cool though. Um, so right now you are, so you're back in in Israel, correct? For a few months, yeah. Oh, and okay. then it was, I'll be back in Berlin. Oh, okay, cool. And mm-hmm. so, how have things been going? Are you busier than ever? Uh, quite a bit, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's be it's been on for ten years now. Since I've started working on uh, metal covers for for bands, and it's been going well. Uh, in each year, I think uh, my work conditions and projects and everything have been going better than last year, so I can't re- actually complain. Oh, that's great! And and you're at the point now where you're you're making your living off of it. You know, you don't have to do anything else to work. Correct? This is your job. Yeah, I think since, what, like seven years now. Oh, that's amazing. And the beginning, I mean, I started doing this stuff when I was 18. I was in the army. I used to, like, uh, sneak in, walk with me to the army via all sorts of uh, strange uh, ways. And then, uh, then when I was out, I got, like, a day job working at... Uh, an advertisement firm, you know, just regular um, commercial stuff. I, I would be doing uh, our direction for the national campaigns for like Toys R Us, Nissan, Renault, Pizza Hut, stuff like that. And I used to come home late at night at like eight or nine and start working on metal covers. And after a while, after like a year, I just quit my day job in order to focus on this stuff. I actually uh, rented a place and then quit my job so I can, so I would have to uh, yeah. <laughs> start my own business and pick myself up from nothing because I signed like a, a lease and everything. So I had to pay rent at the end of the month. So I better get some work done. Wow. Okay. So that was kind of a, a way to kind of uh, um, kick yourself in the ass, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Remove the safety net and just jump all that you know well you know that's amazing to hear because you know i can i can speak from the from the musician standpoint where it is so hard to do music as full-time as a living and you Mm -hmm. know you know uh but you know it's it's amazing to see that you you've been you've been basically able to do what you love now for the last seven years as your job as your main job, that's that's really amazing. Even though I'm sure it's a lot of work. It's so funny. Everybody has been making has been able to make a living out of being in the music industry, except for the musicians. <laughs> because even even the merch guy who travels with the musicians has like a steady salary at this point. But the musicians have to come home and get. I mean, go back to their day jobs. Yeah, exactly. So even with, even with my stuff, I think. My approach to business is very much uh, like community oriented because I come from the same background. I still go to shows and hang with metal people, and you know, I'm I myself am am a rabbit fan. You know, I come to, I go to like online forums and argue with people, just, just like <laughs> just like normal times. Which one is the best Slayer record and everything? And um, so the, my approach to business is the same. When I, whenever I do an album cover, I really try to make it so that the band will have tons of options to make a living out of it. So I send them a great like T-shirt version because that's the most direct way to recoup your uh, your losses mm-hmm. and even make gains out of getting me to do your artwork. So I actually started at at some point. I started like doing the T-shirt version for free. 
because otherwise people will get like a, a graphic student to do it and they usually would just butcher up my work so i said okay it takes me 30 minutes to set it up yeah. <laughs> i mean to convert it from an album cover to a t-shirt version so just i'll just include it in my uh normal offer and then send everybody a t-shirt ready version and everything's been going well since then yeah well, I, mean, I haven't seen a bad t-shirt reproduced since i started uh, doing them myself well and i can uh, at this point i can definitely speak to that um from personal experience i mean uh a the album cover you designed for me was brilliant um oh. and secondly you know our t-shirt design you know, a lot of people. You know, it, it, a lot of people loved it. I mean, it it was enough of a thing where it wasn't like they felt they were wearing, you know, some band's weird logo or something. Or you know, it was subtle enough that people could wear it, and it almost seemed like a, just like a cool design. And you know, maybe didn't have yeah. nothing to do with the band. <laughs> I, I think it comes with age because at this point, yeah, you and I can, uh, can't really go to work with our Cannibal Corpse t-shirts and everything. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, our taste in fashion has changed a lot since we were in high school. So I think we, we both think from the same direction when it comes to to uh, clothing. So it actually yeah. may, made the t-shirts better. <laughs> yeah, a, a little bit more stylish when I was uh, just starting out. Yeah, well, well. Uh, speaking of starting out, so, um, so what what kind of came first? I mean, I, obviously, I know you were you're drawing while you're doing the in the army. Um, yeah. But, but what came first? Was it? Uh, have you been drawing for your whole life? And um, and did did you decide that you wanted to be an artist at a very very early age? And uh, or, and then where did metal come into it, you know, in terms of the music? I think I haven't decided anything. It just happened naturally. I was just drawing since I was a kid, since I was like five, basically, I think. And I used to draw like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles when I was in the first grade. I used to draw, I can't, can't even remember. I, but it all got pretty serious when I was about 13. And I started, I mean, uh, the internet started um, to gain popularity among small businesses. And uh, in order to make money, I would just uh, design uh, websites for like small companies and shops and everything. So that was my first job. I mean, making money out of uh, drawing. But beforehand, I would just draw on everything. I used to do, to do murals on like walls, friends' walls, and my own uh, bedroom and everything. I used to paint... Uh, with everything I could get my hands on, charcoal, pencils, oils, whatever. Mm -hmm. And metal came into the picture when I was about 14 or 15, I think. Uh, I think I got into hard rock uh, for my father when I was like 13 with uh, Deep Purple and uh, Scorpions. Mm -hmm. And then when I discovered metal, I think uh, I was really really obsessed with with music so i started talking to people in uh, web forums and message boards and everything and at some point uh, a few bands needed logos and needed uh, cd art so i just emailed them and that's how it's it all started okay i mean and yeah I, you know the way i met you i mean granted it was a little a little while after that but I mean, you were yeah, you were very much seven. Yeah, two thousand seven. I mean, you were very much a a go getter, so to speak. I mean, you really worked hard to get your name out there and to offer your services and and really tried to promote yourself. And I'm I'm guessing you don't have to do that as much now. People come to you. <laughs> yeah, since <laughs> since I think the the first testament album cover or maybe the second one everything's been pretty steady since but i still from a time to time when i get to talk to like label people and guys from the music industry i, just, I say ah you know on, on your label there's like this huge band or this even like underground band that i really love so uh, if they need anything just call me because i'm constantly searching for new music to listen to mm-hmm regardless of artwork 
So if if I find like a new band that I really really love, I'll just at some point just maybe email them and try to to do something with them. And it happened the same way with you. I remember I was emailing um, Toby mm-hmm. uh, regarding uh, Ko Dot because I I really loved the uh, modeling of the well. Mm-hmm. So I actually knew your music beforehand, and then when I heard the news about the new Kaya Dot record, I just emailed Toby, and that's how I got in touch with you. Yeah. Yeah, because he was, yeah, you know, I mean, he still to this day, I think, is, is pretty much in charge of doing all the artwork for the KO Dot stuff. Um, mm-hmm. he, he was always kind of a, <laughs> uh, a do everything kind of guy. <laughs> but he was like, but yeah, and then, he, but he knew that I was working on something, and he's like, well, you know, Greg needs an artwork, and and there you go. And then I saw your website, and I was just like, hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, I know you knew your stuff from, uh, I think it was uh, Metal Maniacs magazine. Yeah. I think they had like a feature on the modeling of the well when you were releasing, uh, I think it was uh, Exit Your Body. What, which one was it? I think Bath. I can't yep. remember. Uh, it Bath, was, uh, Bath and Leaving Your Body Map came out at the same time. It was a double album. Yeah. So it was, it was back then that I found out about you guys. <laughs> That's really funny. I, I actually just found my uh my mother I, I i was i was at my my parents house and my mother had stored kept this file and it was like you know the greg file and it was a collection of magazines pristine copies of magazines from that time period and one and that was one of them was the metal maniacs one and i was just like wow <laughs> i hadn't seen it in years and so i know the exact one you're talking about that was um it did nothing for our record sales, but it was a lot of it was a lot of fun, and it made my mom very proud of me. <laughs> there was so, so much magic in these magazines. A friend of mine got me for my birthday an old Metal Forces magazine, and at the end you see like um, the pen pal section and like the wanted ads and everything. So there's like an ad from I think either Jeff Walker, or some somebody from Carcass that wants to start a band. <laughs> so like uh, a small message in the um, advertisement section so it's, that he's looking for uh, to start a band so it's it had so so much magic during these uh, magazine times but i haven't seen a metal magazine since for well, since forever well they're trying uh at least in my neck of the woods here in uh boston uh they actually are or the northeast they're they're starting up a, a print zine again oh um, cool you know, I haven't seen it yet um, myself, but I know some people who are involved with it, and uh, and yeah, so I was just like, I'm, it's kind of nice that we're getting back to that. And um, and the other thing I was gonna say too, I mean, so when you were getting into metal, because I'm guessing you sound a lot like I was. I mean, did you used to obsess over the album covers when you were when you had when you you know got a new record? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, the first couple of records I bought were um, choices based only on the album artwork. Because, yep. <laughs> uh, I mean, as I said, my father got me into Deep Purple and uh, Scorpions, and then I was really into Beavis and Butthead. Yep. So I knew all the names like Metallica and Megadeth and Iron Maiden from Beavis and Butthead, but I knew nothing about the actual uh, albums. I mean, which albums should I get? And when I got to the record store, I was looking for the next thing to to listen to after uh, Scorpions and Deep Purple. So I just looked at the album covers. So I picked up Killers and Master of Puppets and Rust in Peace, only based on the album covers. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, and uh, back in those days, you had like a few albums and you would read, read each and every liner note and everything in the booklet and just, you would know them by heart. Yep. <laughs> thanks, you would know the thanks lists by heart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I remember. I album covers. You know the thanks lists. And and were you buying them on CD or tape or? It was CDs at that point. This was yeah. about ninety ninety six, I think. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We. I, I mean, because because my, my experience, I remember. You know, I mean, we we did have CDs, but. Uh, when I going through me going through the same thing as you was more like 91, 92. And mm-hmm. at that point it was, you know, CDs were 
the kind of the expensive things. So we usually got tapes. And even in, with the artwork shrunk down for a tape, you know, my friends and I would just unfold it and just like stare at it. You know, you know, stare at everything and obsess over it. And then when we got the CDs, I remember, especially with the Iron Maiden CDs, I mean, because um, we spent so long looking at uh, Somewhere in Time and looking at... Um, uh, Power Slave, yeah, probably. Yeah, Power Slave and all these other ones. And so with the CD, it was a little bit bigger, so we were able to be like, oh, okay, that's what it was. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the first time I saw an Iron Maiden, Iron Maiden album, uh, artwork, it was in a pretty huge scale. Uh, I remember I was walking into a CD shop in order to buy the new Michael Jackson record. I think it was <laughs> when, when History came out, or I can't remember. Maybe it was like a, two years before, and I was looking for uh, Dangerous, I think, which is another album cover, uh, another album I bought only because of the album cover, because I knew I wanted to get a Michael Jackson album. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know which one because I knew all the songs from the radio and from friends and everything. But I just had to browse for the Mike Jackson uh, section and just look for something that looked like a masterpiece and dangerous was it. Yeah. So uh, on my way to the counter, I just looked up and I saw this huge Iron Maiden poster. It was for uh, the newest album at the time. It was uh, for the X Factor. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. it, and it looked really scary. I remember I was I used to be into um, what was it? Um, a Nightmare on Elm Street mm -hmm. back then. So it immediately clicked because it it felt like the same kind of stuff. So it just I re, I was reminded of it a few years later when I got into hard rock. I rem, I was reminded of oh there's this band that their stuff looked a bit like the whole stuff that I was into when i was a kid oh wow okay that that poster was huge so <clears throat> so first time i saw an iron maiden artwork it was really big and detailed to this day i don't know why so many people hate the that artwork i rem i can understand why they don't like the record but i mean i guess it was a departure from the classic stuff when you i mean when you talk about the style but as an album cover it's amazing yeah, I mean, I can actually comment on that because that was um, that was kind of my experience. Because yeah, I mean, when I got into Iron Maiden, I got into them pretty much right after Bruce had left, um, so mm. like ni like ninety three, and for the long time, you know, I just like obsessed over the old albums and um, and then I remember because you know this is we had internet, but it wasn't like really really great. We never used it for much, but um, mm -hmm. Somehow I figured I found out that they're working on a new album with Blaze, and you know it was just me kind of looking for any kind of sign that this album was going to come out. And I remember uh, they released a T-shirt, um, in and it was kind of based on a class. It was almost like a classic-looking Iron Maiden T-shirt, and it said uh, I forget what it was called, but I was just like it was like oh the Reaper or. or some they're coming back in 95 or something the beast in 95 or something like that and okay. i was like and i was very excited and it was a kind of a cool looking picture of eddie and then so then 95 and i've uh, you know was hounding my record store for the release date they gave me the release date and i remember the day came it was 1995 and i was so excited uh i left school early <laughs> i think actually i don't know if i left early i don't think i had the balls to do that but I went right after school. I said, "This is Iron Maiden release day. This is this is a holiday. This is you know this is my <laughs> this is my Christmas basically." That and, totally. and it took me a while to actually find it in a record store. And when I found it, yeah, when I first saw the artwork, I was just kind of like, "What?" And yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, looking back, I can see it was well done. And don't get me wrong, but it was it. Um, at the time, it was just kind of a letdown. It just felt like a letdown because, you know, and then listening to the album, that was, you know, kind of a letdown too at certain points. But it it, it was such a d departure. It, but to be fair, the artwork aside, I actually thought the brilliant part of that artwork was the pictures of the band. I thought the that the, the... Yeah, the pictures... I can't pictures, remember. 
the the pictures I thought were 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 lighted in such a way that I was I was really impressed by that, and it, and it really kind of set the tone for how much of a darker album that that album was. So I thought that was that was that that actually impressed me a lot. But but yeah, when I first saw that cover, I was just like like all the wind came right out of my sails, and I was just like. Oh. <laughs> So I mean, maybe because that was my first experience. Because yeah, that's that's the same guy who did the Euthanasia, which was the the second album album cover I saw by Megadeth, and that's to this day that's my favorite one. So I didn't have this, uh, you know, this uh, baggage of uh, fandom and uh, you know your shape is taste based yeah. on the kind of stuff you've seen before, and then you're getting let down by seeing anything that's a bit of a departure. Yeah. So I did have this baggage with me. So I immediately loved Euthanasia and immediately loved uh, the X Factor. Oh, that's, that's cool. It's, Outwise. It, it's interesting for me to hear it from that perspective. That that makes total sense to me that, yeah, you know, <laughs> I kind of wish I was like you. I kind of wish I didn't have all that emotional baggage before I went to go pick up the X Factor. <laughs> Virtual Eleven is another example. I think uh, m- maybe it's because of the big ears. He, sh- he shouldn't have drawn it with so with such big ears. But it's a great painting, actually. That's I another agree. one that's that's not not getting his uh, fair share. I agree. Um, no, I I always liked Virtual Eleven too. Uh, I mean, artwork wise. Um, you know, I didn't like the computer the, the computer stuff that was inside of it. Yeah, the but... back cover and, and uh, Ed Hunter. That yeah. was horrible. <laughs> to this day, I maintain I love that game. <laughs> Everyone's like, it's the worst computer game ever. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I played that game. I had so much fun playing that game. <laughs> and they're like, it's the worst. <laughs> oh, I think I gave up after like 10 minutes. <laughs> I can't even remember how it looks like i mean wow uh, 10 minutes and i was out yeah uh, yeah i was a little more stubborn i was like no i'm gonna love this game it's iron maiden i have to love it <laughs> now they got this uh, polish guy who really imitates uh, derek Riggs, so uh, all the t-shirts look exactly the same as uh, they were in the 80s yeah yeah album I cover, not. they're getting like, different guys to do the album covers yeah, and and you know I appreciate that, but there really is only one Derek Riggs, and 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 I mean Derek Riggs, his, I mean, and this is again like growing up, uh, it's a little different I think for kids now because so much music is traded digitally that there's yeah. not really as much emphasis on the artwork. But for us growing up, I mean, we knew the artists, you know, I mean. We knew who did what, and and to me and my friends, Derek Riggs was a god. I mean, I think actually I, I'd argue the exact opposite about this. And you can, uh, I remember uh, reading an in, a recent interview with uh, Ed Repka, and he said that he has like ten times more work now doing metal album covers than doing the '80s and the '90s combined because of the internet. And so. Many more people know his name right now and know what he's done and his legacy and history and everything because of the internet. And oh, wow. uh, as far as the uh, the focus on artwork is concerned, everything is going back full circle now because actually, when I listen to music on my uh, on my phone or on my uh, tablet PC, the um, the resolution is now actually higher than the CD version at this point. Oh. So I actually don't mind it. When uh, when people say I never got the CD, I never got the vinyl because, well, if if you saw it on uh, on Spotify using your tablet, you actually saw it in better conditions when printed on a CD, oh. which is fun. Yeah, okay. because on CD I, I used to send when you, on CD you see like one thousand five one thousand five hundred pixels and. Right now on the new machines, you see even more, up to 2,000. So actually, you can get more details, better colors. You don't have to, uh, I mean, sometimes colors get butchered up in the States or in Japan or whatever. And right now, when it's done digitally, usually it's, it looks the same on uh, most machines. So And the distribution is much uh, more broad. 
now because you know you have new markets that are opened as opposed to the to the 80s and 90s you have the entire um, east european part of the world and china and everyone i mean you can go to like uh, the f- facebook page of exodus and they have 1 million fans what i mean w- whenever they will release their new album cover i mean 1 million people will see it immediately with a, I mean, within a couple of seconds. And back in the 80s or the 90s, you would have to pay a lot of money to MTV and advertisement and such in order to get to a fraction of a million. Right, yeah. Well, I, I, you know, part of this, uh, this interview podcast, part of the reason I, I wanted to do it and talk to people is, to, is also to learn. And, you know, um, I like when when people see things from a different perspective and kind of int- show me that, no, the world isn't like what you think it is. <laughs> Stop being so negative. <laughs> oh, oh, the money is gone. Don't get me wrong. The money is gone. But the, fo- but the focus and the need for, for artwork has been greater than ever because there's like an influx of bands and the, and the market is completely saturated. So you want to outdo your peers. And back then, you could release anything. I mean, you remember Flotsam and Jetsam's Doomsday for the Deceiver? Yep. That would never hap- that would have never happened today. Yeah. <laughs> I actually have an autographed copy of that. <laughs> Great record, but <laughs> God, that album cover. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, there were a, re- a lot of really bad metal album covers in the 80s, to be fair. Like, and, and then also, and then into the 90s, I... I remember I was I never liked mo- a lot of uh, album covers. There were some that were good, but I, I I felt like the art, you know, the artwork didn't. Sorry, let me rephrase this. To me, I think uh, when artwork I th- I felt came back in was um was Travis Smith. Would you agree? I agree. Fully yeah, agree. Yeah, I mean it, it, he was the next guy where you know. He was kind of the trendsetter for a long time. I mean, between death, uh, at least that's when I first came to to know him was through Nevermore. Yeah, all oh, especially Nevermore. Um, but to be fair, during the nineties, you still had uh, Hugh Simon, the the guy who did the Euthanasia and X Factor, and you had yep. uh, Dave McKean, who did basically everything. Yeah. For- from Fear Factory to Machine Head to Alice Cooper, Deep Purple, I can't, uh, not Deep Purple, uh, Dream Theater. He did everything during the 90s. Oh, Dave, that was Dave McKean who did um, um, Fear Factory? Yeah, he did Obsolete and uh, The Manufacturer. Really? I, I, you know, as much of an artist fan as I am, I never knew that. Um but okay, that's cool, and I love Dave McKean. I mean, uh, I know him from the comic books mostly, but uh, okay, cool. Go, go to his website and look at the the credits. I mean, he did every metal album cover uh, issued in the '90s. It was amazing, and you can see his influence on on Travis Smith, I think, and the new wave of uh, photo manipulation. Uh, outward guys that really picked up uh, during the early stages of, of the new millennium. Mm-hmm. Well, and uh, it's kind of interesting for me, my experience with Travis Smith, um, and this kind of ties back to you too, because, um, um, you know, when I was uh, looking at albums, because I worked at, at a radio station in my college, and I would get the free copies of, of a lot of albums. So I, I got to see a lot of them as they came out. And w- what I noticed, I felt that with Travis Smith, that when he was really, like you could tell almost when he was doing art for a project he really cared about. And then there were mm-hmm. some some of them ones where I felt like he was kind of phoning it in. <laughs> and... Uh, oh, you know and like but but even when he phoned it in i mean people would see like oh it's travis smith and and there was like a certain amount of style to it but i felt like i I felt like there's somewhere he was just kind of like trying to say like oh what's the travis smith album cover supposed to look like whereas i felt there were some album covers he did especially his black and white work um Mm -hmm. you know especially um uh, opeth yeah opeth dreaming neon black uh, I mean, Dreaming Neon Black to me was one of the best 
that's really what got me, you know. That's um, one of my favorite records of all yeah. time. Oh, yeah, exactly. It's one of my top ten. And uh, it was just an amazing album. And uh, and that artwork, I thought, was, was really well done. And it, was, it didn't look like a, a lot of the other stuff he had done. Um, you it's know, funny. I got this record thinking it was like this dark, gothic type of band because I saw the artwork. And um, the guy who worked at the, uh, at the CD shop played, I think, one of the more doomier, gloomier songs at the end. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, I was really into Agalok and uh, Amorphis and Catatonia and all the kind of bands. So I just picked it up immediately for, directly from the counter because it was like on the now playing stand. And then I got home and played the first song and it was like so fast paced. I was like, oh, is this power <laughs> metal? What, I, where's my receipt? Uh, I mean, I, I hope I can give it back. And then I f- fell in love with it by the time the song was over. Yeah, that uh, that album was. And getting back to, to Travis Smith later on, uh, I think no, it was much later on. My favorite piece of uh, of artwork from uh, Travis would be the Anathema one. Uh, can't remember the name of the album. The one with the red one, where with the guy uh, in a boat, in a puddle. Oh, um, yeah, uh, a natural disaster. Great record as well, but the uh, but the concept for the album artwork is simply brilliant. Really hard hitting, direct, simple, amazing. Remember 
I was going to say too is is I remember when you after you first got in contact with me, and uh, you know I wasn't sure what I was going to do for the album for my album cover. I mean, originally I I I had actually talked to a guy who was who did um, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but he did those uh, daguerreotypes. You know the um, I don't know the the kind of black and white kind of exp- uh, I'm not describing them very well, but etchings maybe or yeah um, yeah I'm trying to find the best way to describe them. But anyway, because I remember my original concept was I was like, oh, I want something kind of like Dreaming Neon Black, and um and and so he did this kind of cool classic photography looking stuff that I was like, oh okay. But that fell through, and you know, because because you, you know, as you know, I take forever to make an album, and yeah. um, <laughs> and so I never heard back from him, and blah blah blah, whatever. But then I remember when I looked at your stuff, um, you know, you know, I kind of, I never felt that you were, um, uh, you know, in the style of Travis Smith. But what I what I did feel, I was like, oh, this is. Th- when I was looking at your stuff, I was like, this is the kind of stuff I wish other people were doing. And I remember being like, okay, this kid is talented. (laughs) Thanks, man. And and I was just like, all right, I knew. And, and just from working with you, um, and the, the way you, you know, I, you know, I gave you an idea. I said, all right, how about you do this? And, you know, and I remember just thinking, yeah, make me a, a an ancient looking robot, <laughs> and you did. I, and so was and the it, Queen album, maybe. Yeah, like, that's right. Yeah, I was like, I was like, I want something that looks kind. Of, yeah, yeah, the because that Queen album, um, News of the World, that yeah. I mean, the, the robot on that is terrifying and awesome, but you know, still classic looking. And uh, and yeah, and I remember when you first sent the design back to me, I was like. Holy shit! <laughs> I was like showing it off to everybody. I'm like, this kid's working for me. This kid's working for me. <laughs> I'm like, look at this. <laughs> that um, was the first and only robot I think I ever done. Maybe I did one other robot for a band called Shivi uh-huh. from Canada, a stoner uh, doom band. Uh-huh. But I think I think it like most of the stuff I do. I think uh, if it comes out original, it's mostly because I'm really uneducated in this uh, field. So I start up from scratch. I don't have any any uh, references to to look at. Actually, my fa- if if you're talking about uh, science fiction, my favorite robot of all time would be the one in. You remember that uh, Mighty Mouse cartoon mm-hmm. from the eighties? It had like an episode where a giant robot fell from from the moon at some point, and his mother came to pick him up at the end of the the episode. That to this day, that's my only uh, that's my only favorite robot because I was never into science fiction at all. I haven't even seen uh, neither movie from Star Wars or Star Trek even. Nothing. Um, oh, jeez. <laughs> really? Well. Now it's not the best time to watch a Star Wars movie anyway, because the only versions you'd get are the the shitty versions. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, it's the same as uh, if you try to listen to the first few Aussie records that just replaced everything. Oh my god! Oh, don't get me started on that. That I, I think I think they've actually replaced it now. Um, I think I read that Ozzy himself got pissed off about it. He's, and he said, you know, I, I don't even care anymore. It's a stupid argument to have. And they re, so they put the original bass and drum tracks back in. That was the most horrible idea I've ever heard. I mean, replacing classic tracks. I mean, I and the rhythm section on that. Like, I mean, every guy who played on those uh, first couple of records, I mean, how, how can you replace it? You, you can't. I mean, those... I, I mean, those are albums, sir. I mean, yeah, you can look at production-wise. Blizzard of Oz is is rough around the edges. I mean, I could probably make a a, a little bit better production-wise album in my basement, but uh, and that's and that's just more of a exaggeration. I probably couldn't, but <laughs> but 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 I mean, it was it was a rough it was a raw production style, and but those yeah the at that time it just you know. 
It was but I prefer it. I mean, at least it had character. Exactly. When I, to, when I listen to new recordings, everybody sounds exactly the same because, I mean, everything is using presets for everything. I mean, you have yep. a guitar amp simulators that go like directly, don't have to go through a mic even, so everything sounds... You, you just hear the same frequencies. Your ear just recognize all these tones uh, so the same with drums drums is, is the worst because everything is sampled from the same albums you've been listening to for the last 10 yeah. years so everything sounds exactly the same everything is stock yeah i mean well you know i mean when the studio that i record out of is in in western massachusetts and it's run well they got their name because the the guy from kill switch engage records there or he, mm-hmm. he, he works there and um yeah, I mean, uh, talking to the engineers there, and they say, yeah, these kids come in and want to sound like this record or this record, and yeah, it's uh, it, it's a machine, it's a it's a factory, and um... but to be like this during the the eighties and the nineties as well, but we couldn't actually duplicate the same sound, so we would just aim to the this general direction and whatever comes out comes out because during the 90s it was the same everybody wanted to sound like pantera yeah Every guy going into the studio asked for like huge guitars exactly like pantera and because we didn't have the samples and the amp simulations back then it all still came out quite original at the end but yeah exactly the 90s were over and, sa- and all these samples kicked in i mean uh, everything went downhill from that point on. I well, it, no, I, I agree with you. Um, I mean, and I'll even go one step further and say that as much as I loved the Pantera albums when they first came out, um, I personally hold Vinnie Paul responsible for the shitty drum tones that uh, that I had to deal with on metal albums from then on forward because everyone wanted that sample uh the triggered drum sound and to me like triggered drums are the first sign that make me want to turn something off uh except when it's part of a concept you know with ministry or fear oh factory. yeah yeah sorry i was gonna i was gonna throw that throw that in there yeah yeah fear factory is 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 different fear factory doesn't bother me because like you said it's part of their concept and and there's something but I mean more when someone tries to make a metal as kind of a standard metal album and then it's just like as soon as I hear that kick drum I'm like nope (laughs) I can totally relate but still when this was like a virgin territory when even in black metal you remember at the end of the 90s um, like the mayhem albums and Hellhammer started using like these really obvious triggers and Cradle of Filth and Demo Burger as well. It was new back then, so it still sounds uh, quite fresh because there was nothing to compare it prior to that point. It sounded crazy when you listen to that May- Mayhem record that they released. Which one was it? Um, Grand Declaration of War. Yeah, yeah, I remember Trump that. Amazing at that, at that point. But afterwards, they, everybody just came into the studio and asked for the exact same drums, like load the, the Hellhammer preset. Let me yeah. play on that. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, and I can um, I can also speak to, I know when I go into a, a studio situation for recording, um, I usually insist that, I mean, all my rhythm guitar stuff is definitely amplifiers and also a variety of amplifiers i don't like just using one sound you know i'm a big fan of of i'm like there's so many great amplifiers out there i don't have the amount of money to afford them all for myself so if i can at least borrow them for (laughs) in a studio and and use them to try and get a sound that i normally wouldn't get just me you know dicking around in my rehearsal space um so, I mean, you know, and I think there are some, in, in amp simulation, I agree too, is the worst. It's gotten to a point now where there is something, there, there are interesting ones you can use. Um, I've been messing around with one um, for doing my guitar solos at home, and, uh, it, and I, I'm very impressed with it. It actually gets these really interesting tones that don't sound like, you know... 
like cert, like like what they used to sound like. So it's it, the technology is moving. It's just as soon as it came out and you know it became cost effective, people just started using it and. You know. But I think if it sounds original, that's the bottom line for me because it sounds like right. we're begging on technology and advancement, but but really, I'm really far from it because whenever I hear one of these new uh, retro bands that actually uses the, I mean, uh, Fender Strats through uh, an old Marshall cabinet and it sounds exactly the same as in the in the 70s, that's that's pretty much the same thing for me. As using like a trigger drum sampled from, uh, I mean that sound like the rest of the oh. new metal stuff from the 2000 because it, it's not about technology; it's about repetition. Mm -hmm. So, in in my eyes, the all these new metal bands that use all all the new uh, modern sampling and everything, and the new retro bands who use all this retro equipment. They're both to blame for the exactly the same thing, and that's sounding exactly like everything that's been on before the, beforehand. So I can't listen to both at the same time. It doesn't really matter if it's retro, if it's organic or uh, high tech. I see. No, you, I in complete agreement. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, it's it's not it's not you know what you do or don't have. It's how you use it and, and what is your goal with it? Are you trying to make a sound, you know, like I really want to sound like this or you're like, okay, I'm going to use this to create what I sound like. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, I think it, one of the prime examples would be a band like Typo Negative because they use trigger drums that sounded dated. I mean, the guitars sounded horrible. Even on the better produced records, they would say we went to this market and bought this shitty uh, guitar pedal for uh, 60 bucks. But the production was really original on these records. So it, uh, you don't even hear it that the drums are really triggered and the uh, guitar distortion is horrible because the songwriting was so advanced and so out there and so original that it all fell into place. Yeah. Regardless of what equipment uh, they used. Get another band... I mean, into the studio, the exact minute uh, typo negative was done, get them to play the same instruments, it would never sound the same. No, uh, true. Exactly. Um, well, one thing I wanted to, um, not to shift too much from uh, the discussion, because this is, is really cool, but uh, one thing I did want to ask you is, um, so when you're, you yourself are working on uh, your artwork, now, do you, do you draw on paper and then bring it into the computer or do you draw digitally now through, uh, you know, like a digital program? What, what's your method? It changes from each and every project to another. Uh, I mean, some, some album covers are like plain photography even. Mm -hmm. Some of them started out in pencil and a few of them are actually made in clay. So, I think I, I try to start anew with each and every project I, I take on because it would never make sense to make a Baliset record and a Sodom record look uh, the same and have the same aesthetics. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I so, agree. <laughs> and because I don't have this, um, I mean, art baggage that I carry because I was never into science fiction, I was never into fantasy, I was never really into comics, I was never actually into like fine art. Uh, I don't have many like favorite artists um, that I don't really care about uh, a certain period or a certain style or a certain method how to do things so I just listen to the record and try to imagine how the I mean all the previous records if I don't have the new pre-production samples so I listen to the all just listen to the music and try to figure out which way to attack this project I mean what would be the best strategy so it changes each and every time I get a project. Mm, okay, that's good to hear. And um, and I have to ask, uh, <laughs> how do you go about designing uh, a huge stage backdrop? <laughs> how do you know? How do how do you translate that so that it'll, when they blow it up, it'll actually look really good on uh, as a backdrop? <laughs> uh, like everything, it's uh, trial and error. I think uh, first. 
I think first backdrop I did was actually for Testament. So pressure was on. The, it was just the, the reunion uh, album cycle and everything. And they were playing huge stages. It was uh, on... This was actually, if one of your next questions would be, what is your worst moment uh, mm-hmm. in, in this career, would be this one. Back then, they would ask me to send them the backdrop in layers because they didn't know uh, where to put all the certain stuff so the amps and the drums wouldn't block the view. So they told me to send the, um, the backdrop for, for the Formation of the Nation album cover. If you remember it, it's like angels with swords in the sky Mm -hmm. so they asked me to send them in in two photoshop layers one layer should have the sky and one layer should have the um, the angels and it was done in like 25 feet wide i think you have to work in low resolution out i mean because otherwise your computer your computer will blow up so i had to work with just only two layers low resolution and send and I sent it to them, and then they said after a few days we're playing a forty feet st- uh, stage in a download festival in the UK. <laughs> so we need we need you to send the same artwork, but uh, on like forty feet, and it couldn't go through um, through any FTP program or whatever because the file was so huge when I when it had to be twice the size. So I told them, okay, I can't send it in layers. I will remove the, um, the angels and just send you the, the background, the clouds. So we will take the angels from this other file I just sent you a few days ago and put it on the new background ground that I'm sending you, which is like 40 feet wide. It had more artwork on the left and on the right. Simple tasks, I think. <laughs> Seems like you have two layers, just copy one on top of each other. Somehow those instruction, instructions didn't get to the printing factory. So they were on the main stage in Download Festival in front of tens, I can't, don't even know how many fans. And they rolled in the, um, the backdrop and it was just clouds. <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> that was my, and they called me explaining the situation and I was like, this is the worst thing that could ever happen to me. And this was like the huge uh, return to the big stages uh, period. Uh. And not only that, but I mean, I mean, this was when you really kind of made like a breakthrough, right? This is kind of when you, your, your art was finally, you know, you're starting to get more notice as an artist um for yeah so i was so so pissed off because it it all depended on one guy at the printing factory that instead of just sending the file forwarding the entire email with the instructions intact yeah so it's like a click of a mouse i mean about include original text or whatever that caused this entire situation but luckily they understood that whoever at the printing factory is the one that made a mistake on uh, I mean, a few hours later, I sent them a new file and they printed it up, sent them, sent it very quickly because the the printing factory apologized and everything, and then everything worked out at the end. But those like twenty four hours were horrible oh. because that was my my biggest client at the time, my big breakthrough, as you said. And even if it's clear to everyone that it's not your fault, you don't want to be associated with these kinds of uh, disasters right exactly yeah well yeah. It, well i'm glad it worked out because i mean i remember seeing pictures of testament playing um and it's, and testament's a band i really love anyway and i Me remember too, yeah. and i remember when i found found out you were doing the album artwork i was like so proud so proud of you um you know, it because was I, we worked together before Testament. I can't uh, yeah, we did. Yeah, we worked together. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think the album came out till a little bit after, till around that same time. But you know, mm. uh, at the time, uh, yeah, I remember. You know, um, yeah, because I, I think, think Formation is two thousand eight. Yeah. Probably. So, um, so, but I remember seeing, see, hearing that you did the artwork and, and just being very happy for you because I like when, when good people, 
good artists um, do well. You know that that makes me happy. And to uh, and I remember seeing pictures of you standing near the backdrops, and I you know I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah. oh, he's doing well. <laughs> and I was following Dave McKean. Uh, I mean, which added to the pressure as well. Dave McKean did the last uh, few album covers. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I think I think Travis Smith did an, did one as well. I think it was he did he did the just a Japanese uh, release or something. Yeah, I thought he did. He do the Gathering? I forget. Or was that? No, no, that was Dave McKean. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, he uh. did the Low, the Monic, and the, and the Gathering. Oh wow! Okay. Um. Cool. Uh. Well, so, so pressure was on, but uh, it was exciting times. <laughs> well, one thing, um, so what I've been doing in these interviews too is, you know, as I talk to musicians, I, I, you know, I try to ask them, you know, oh, in your development as a music, as, as a songwriter, as a composer, you know, you know, what's one moment, like um, I call it the holy fuck moment where you hear something and it like you know it's, it makes you you know it brings out um inspiration or whatever uh let me modify that for you um what was one can you name one or two album covers that uh or pieces of art or whatever that really kind of blew your mind and really got you to think you know a little bit more creatively about yourself or about your work i mean of my own stuff or other people's work? Uh, other people's work. Like, like, well, like, what was the first album cover you saw that really, like, you know, blew you away? That really kind of like, um, yeah, blew well, your mind. <laughs> I think, as I said, it was uh, Michael Jackson's "Dangerous," uh, but I can also point to "Kilos" by Maiden. I, I was obsessed with that album cover. I pay, I did like a reproduction of it on my bedroom wall when I was 15. And I really studied it and uh, tried to emulate it in any way. I, I've started it for so long. And what was amazing about it, I think, was the way colors um, made you connect with the atmosphere on the record. Because all, all those yellows and that um, like... You had this street atmosphere in the back with like yellow li light that used to be really popular in the 90s during the night. And then the music started off and, uh, and Paul Diano is singing about uh, running through the streets of Paris and everything. And it, it just, it gets you inside uh, the scenario. And it was amazing to see how much power uh, visuals have over music. But actually... If I'm trying to look for the first time, it would be uh, The Wall by Pink Floyd. I mean, watching the, the movie, because that really added another dimension to the music. And to this day, if I listen to the record, I mean, I see in my mind all these visuals from the movie. Mm -hmm. And it actually, it feels bizarre not to think about it. I mean, not it's like, it's like watching a movie... Uh, it would be like watching a movie with your eyes folded. So, I mean, that was the first time I realized I, I was maybe six when my father, I mean, my father was a big, uh, still is a big uh, Pink Floyd uh, fanatic. So, so he showed me the wall on the VHS and I was completely blown away. It, I was terrified at the same time because some of these things are really graphic for a six-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but the, but the impact was so immense that I think this was a turning point where music and visuals became the same. I mean, uh, to, maybe that was part of the reason I never felt uh, the need to dig in so much into um, like classic art and like pure uh, visual arts because music and movies and television has have so much like amazing visuals in them that I never felt the need to dig into what you, you might call fine art. Right. Right. Music as well. Oh, that's cool. And, um, 
and and one question um one thing i was i i was thinking about and uh um i'm trying to phrase this in the best way possible but man so you uh you grew up you you grew up in israel for your whole life correct until you moved to germany yeah i think for like 25 years yeah and and what part of of israel did you grow, grow up in I was originally from uh, from Batyam, uh, a city really close to Tel Aviv. And when I was six, uh, my parents moved to Gan Yavne, which is uh, about 20 minutes uh, south from uh, from Tel Aviv. But it's a, a really small country. So it's uh, when you ask people about uh, that part of Israel, they say, oh, that's the south, like 20 minutes uh, below, 20 minutes south, south of the center. It's like 10 minutes from uh, from the Gaza Strip uh, mm-hmm. by car. And um, that's where I grew up until the point when uh, I had, uh, when I was drafted to the army. And then I ran, afterwards I rented a few places in the north, in Haifa and in Hovot, uh, which is another city in the center, more or less. And... Afterwards, I just moved to Berlin after like a short period of living in Prague and uh, another few small c- cities around uh, Europe, but only for like short whiles. I lived in Prague for maybe a couple of months, maybe. Okay, because I was I was as a, as a Westerner uh, or uh, Amer- American. Um, I mean, I always I try not to assume things about other countries because i feel like a lot of americans do <laughs> and i hate that yeah, um, <laughs> yeah but um but how growing up in now were you close to a lot of the you know the the kind of the tensions and the violence in israel did you did you experience that from where where you were um I think uh, basically you can say that that in Israel uh, each and every person has like uh, maybe one or two degrees of separation between him and a family member or a friend of a friend who was injured or died during like war or uh, or suicide attacks or whatever. I mean, I knew uh, friends of friends who who died in battle but uh, it, it's such a small country and the army is, is such a big part of uh, everyday life and I mean uh, national holidays have a lot of stuff to do with uh, with fallen heroes and uh, Holocaust Day Memorial and uh, Independence Day is really tied in with, uh, with uh, the military aspect of uh, gaining independence and everything so I mean, I don't know any other way to to grow up in because I only had one childhood, but uh, so it all seemed normal, and and still does because uh, when considering the history of uh, of the place, but it, it didn't really uh, affect me. I think. I mean, the mo- the most. Uh, I mean, as far as violence is concerned, I think movies and TV had. Uh, I mean, a greater involvement in my personal life okay. luckily yeah luckily, luckily. <laughs> even when in my uh, when i was when i was in the army i was i mean in the beginning i was uh, uh fuel safety uh what was it fuel safety uh administrator or whatever i was something that concerned with fuel safety for like uh, in the air force for jet fuel for a few months and then i moved to become uh, actually a web designer in the army for like another year because someone would have to update the the lunch schedule mm-hmm. on the uh, we had like this uh, intranet like this small internet uh, network inside of each and every army base so we would like build the um, the local website <laughs> so even when i was in the army it had nothing to do with uh, with conflict and violence and everything no oh, lucky yeah l- l- yeah that is lucky well i mean lucky for all of us because <laughs> now we get to enjoy your artwork <laughs> yeah um 
and I get to to breathe. But yeah, but I think that the mortality rate is not that high. It's it's pretty normal, I think. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I when think when you divide the number of of people that go to the army and the amount of people that died in battle, it's like really small because everybody has to go to mandatory service. Oh, I, I could never imagine what that would be like. I, <laughs> I don't know if I would have lasted. <laughs> me, me at 17, I couldn't imagine it as well. <laughs> I mean, it was a reality. I mean, the, uh, when you were 17, the, the worst thing, thing uh, about this entire situation was that they cut your hair. And I had like long hair up to my the middle of my back. And uh, it was really heartbreaking to a guy like a metalhead in his uh, team. <laughs> But you get over it. It's okay. <laughs> Again, luckily, this is my main uh, point of aggravation from the the army. Yeah, so it's okay. Yeah, yeah, I can I can understand that. Well, um, uh, well I didn't really have any other questions for you. I mean, uh, thank you for taking the time to talk with me, though. Sure. Um, I mean, I think. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, you've been a joy to work with um, from a visual standpoint for my own music. I mean, I, I mean, you you always take my ideas and uh, whatever silly, stupid idea I have artwork wise, and you really transform it into something beautiful. And uh, whether or not people like my music is one thing, but everyone loves my artwork. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to finish the new one because we've started it. I think like. Two and a half years ago. Yeah, yeah I got. I locked you in at your old rates. <laughs> yeah, that, that doesn't matter because I really. That was like, you commissioned an old painting of mine, and you wanted to add new stuff, which actually works with uh, the storyline that I had in mind. So I'm really looking forward to finish this one. I I agree. I, I'm looking forward to it too. Uh, I'm looking forward to finishing it from a musical standpoint too. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was I was like listening to the Ballistot records after they're done. Oh, so I mean, this is my greatest joy uh, yeah. to be able to work with stuff that I admire and be part of great records. Because uh, even from a selfish point of view, if you did a great album cover for a really bad record, nobody would remember it. No, people would actually uh, discriminate against. Uh, when, when you talk about uh, the greatest album covers of all time, usually they people would point out records where the music is good as well. Yeah. Because you never pay attention to the ones with bad artwork, with bad music. That's true. That's true. Um, well, still, I mean, you, uh, you know, everything about what you did really speaks to, you know, um, to my creative sensibilities. And, and working with you has been a joy, and I will continue to work with you, <laughs> provided I can afford it. <laughs> since you're <laughs> since you're off in the, uh, <laughs> um, you know, you're off on a new level now. But um, but yeah, but thank you for for taking the time. I know you're hugely busy. I mean, what uh, what kind of projects do you have going on that you can speak about? Uh, I've been working with uh, Exodus on some stuff. Uh, you can go to my uh, Facebook account and you can see the new stage design I did for them uh, about a week ago. Um, wh what else? I'm working with uh, Eric from uh, Testament on his uh, Dragon Lord project. Um, just finished uh, new album covers for uh, Incantation and uh, tons of other stuff. Okay. I mean, those are the prime ones, I think, right now. Okay, but basically, you're booked up for the whole rest of the year, I'm guessing. <laughs> Not for the rest. I, I don't <laughs> like booking that far ahead because usually um, usually I get to a point... To, I mean, the good ones, I mean, my favorite bands always seem to want something over the last minute, you know? They mm -hmm. call you, say, okay, we need it. Uh, can you make it in like a week or so or like two weeks? And then I would get really stressed if I have the um, the rest of the of the month pre-booked, like a year in advance, and then the pressure is on me because people have been waiting for their album cover for a year. So I usually um, 
book for three months in advance. And once it goes past three months, I say uh, that I can't uh, squeeze anything else for the next three months. And, uh, and, but I leave a safety buffer in order to squeeze in rush projects, which are uh, usually reserved for uh, special cases when a band which I really like call me and ask for something over the last minute or so. Okay. So it's more or less during the last four or five years, it's like three months, maybe four booked in advance, and the rest is uh, rush projects. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, you know, um, I'll let you get back to your work. Um, Thanks. And I'll uh, <laughs> have another cup of coffee and try to wake up because of the time difference. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, so thanks again, and I'm really happy for you, um, for your success. And um, Thanks for being the, uh, where, back when I was doing only local stuff. Oh, same thing, no really. problem. Thank Much you. Much appreciation. <laughs> because at the same time, I, I, I wrote you because I like the music and I wanted to be involved. Oh, cool. Well, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. And um, so where so where can people find your stuff? So you're at elironcantor.com, correct? And they can just Google it and they, they'll yeah. find it. I'm the, only, I'm the only guy in the world with this name. So <laughs> just Google it and you, you'll see the website, Facebook, whatever. I think Facebook is better if you want to get updated with the most recent stuff. And uh, so go to Facebook, I think. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, have a good rest of the day and uh, stay too. safe and uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. Me too. All right. Thanks, Eliron. Have a good day. Cheers. All right.